Welcome to Get Sleepy, the podcast where we listen, we relax, and we get sleepy. I'm your host, Thomas. Thanks for joining me here tonight. This evening, we'll visit the peaceful country estate of the Roman Emperor Hadrian. This luxurious country retreat was his private haven and a place where he could truly relax. We'll spend some time exploring the grounds and relaxing in his company this evening. Before we travel back into distant history for our story, let's take a moment to be mindful and aware of the present. Take a nice, deep breath, breathing in through your nose and out through your nose or mouth. And as you breathe slowly and smoothly, finding a consistent rhythm that helps you relax, begin to scan your awareness over your whole body, starting from the top of your head and working down. As you pay attention to your body, just note how each area feels. It might be relaxed and tired, or it might be a little tense and restless. You may notice aches or discomfort in some places, especially if you've had an active day. Without judgment, just notice these sensations and reassure yourself that now is the time to rest. If any areas feel particularly tense, spend a bit of time just focusing on that spot. Breathing in the calming breaths and letting go of any excess energy and tension. Gradually scan all the way down, through your legs and into the feet as well. And in your own time, take a few more deep breaths before letting your breathing return to its natural pace and rhythm. It's time to relax like royalty as you drift towards a restful night's sleep. Our story begins long ago at the country retreat of the Roman Emperor Hadrian. It's the early years of the second century CE, and the emperor Hadrian is midway through his reign. Whenever he can, he comes to his newly built estate in Tibur, which is located in a picturesque part of the countryside. It's only 20 miles from Rome, but it feels like another world. On this warm, sunny afternoon in late spring, Hadrian is walking through the gardens of his villa. He's a tall, 
middle-aged man with dark curly hair and a neatly trimmed beard. Although he's an emperor, he's not dressed like one. He's wearing light, simple clothes and his most comfortable pair of sandals as he strolls through the gardens. Right now, there's no need to wear one of his more elegant togas or tunics. He's not working today, and he doesn't have any appointments scheduled. Instead, he's enjoying a well-deserved break in the country, as he's just returned from a hectic week in Rome as well as attending all the usual meetings, he was kept busy overseeing his team of architects. They're currently rebuilding one of the most important temples in the city, the Pantheon. Hadrian enjoys most of his imperial duties, particularly when the work involves architectural projects but he soon grows tired of living in the city. So whenever he has the chance, he comes out here to the country. Traveling by horse from Rome, it only takes a couple of hours, so he'll often come here for a weekend. Increasingly, a weekend becomes a week, then two, then three. In this moment, Hadrian's just beginning to settle into the rhythm of country life once again. He arrived this morning, and after a hearty lunch, began his usual tour of the grounds. Now he's walking through an elegant garden on the edge of the estate, while his faithful black dog, Lydia, trots behind him. This area is one of Hadrian's favorite parts of the villa, combining man-made luxury with natural beauty. The pathways are lined with exquisite marble statues and fountains fragrant wisteria plants cascade down the nearby wall, covering the bricks with their beautiful violet blooms. In the distance is a long pool, its surface glittering in the sunlight. There are no sounds here, except for the quiet footsteps of Hadrian and his dog, and the trickling waters of the fountains. Then Hadrian stops and stands still for a moment to listen more carefully. Now he becomes aware of the birdsong. Close by are the twittering sparrows, that come to the edge of the fountains to drink and bathe. Further away, he can detect other distant melodies from birds that are out of sight. Perhaps they're hidden in the branches of the cypresses or in the graceful umbrella pine trees that surround the estate. Hadrian lets out a deep sigh of contentment. He's so happy to be back here once again, in a place where he can finally relax and unwind. He can already feel the pressures and worries of the week melting away. Whenever he comes here, he instantly feels younger and lighter, as though a weight has been lifted. 
Hadrian can only tolerate the hustle and bustle of the city for so long. Compared to Rome, the villa at Tibur feels like a kind of rural paradise. It's so peaceful here, and the air is cool and fresh. Hadrian breathes in deeply and smiles. He feels so fortunate to have a home in the country. Not just a home, but a sanctuary he can come to whenever he wants. The villa is Hadrian's dream home, a place he designed himself. He knew he wanted a country retreat, not too far from the capital. And while there were plenty of existing houses, none were quite right. He liked the idea of creating something bigger and more personal. When he worked with his architects to design the villa, he told them that he wanted to create his ideal city in miniature. Hadrian's villa is enormous, with more than 30 buildings and extensive gardens. The estate is even larger than the town of Pompeii. There are countless pools, fountains, and thermal baths. In addition to the residential buildings, there are also libraries, temples, and grand courtyards and pavilions. There's even a private house on an artificial island. During construction, no expense was spared. Everything in the villa was built from the finest materials. The floors are made from rare marble, as well as glass and ivory tiles arranged in intricate geometric shapes. The walls are covered with marble or painted frescoes. Many of the rooms are decorated with vivid mosaic art, depicting birds, animals, and mythological scenes. In some ways, the villa is similar to other imperial residences. Roman emperors have always liked to live in luxury. Hadrian's main residence on the Palatine Hill in Rome is also lavishly decorated. What makes this country villa so special is Hadrian's unique vision. He was directly involved in the design of many buildings, as well as the selection of materials. When he designed his villa, Hadrian had a very specific idea in mind. He didn't want to create a house that was merely luxurious, but rather a place that represented his life and his passions. In recent years, Hadrian has traveled incessantly across the Roman Empire, through regions that will one day be known as Britain, Greece, Turkey, Iran, and Northern Africa. Although many of these journeys were related to his responsibilities as an emperor, Hadrian also has a deep love of travel. He has such fond memories of all the places he's been from the green fields of the north to the desert landscapes of the south. This is why Hadrian's villa 
incorporates a range of architectural styles and influences. The elegant layout of the estate is classic Roman design, but certain areas are directly inspired by his travels abroad. Right now, Hadrian's walking through part of the garden that mixes some of these influences. The pathway leads to a long, artificial pool surrounded by stone columns and archways. This pool is lined with majestic, colourful marble sculptures of Roman gods, as well as a row of Greek caryatids. These are decorative statues of women in flowing dresses, which stand in for columns to support the stone structure above. As Hadrian slowly approaches the pool, he smiles. This view always fills him with a sense of deep satisfaction. The pool's symmetrical beauty and grace is exactly what he intended, and it's the perfect combination of Greek, Roman, and Egyptian styles. This pool represents a branch of the River Nile, and at the far end is a shell-shaped grotto. This cave is decorative, but it's also a kind of shrine or temple dedicated to Serapis, the Egyptian god of the underworld. Inside the cave, is a marble sculpture of the god. Serapis is portrayed as a man with wild, flowing hair, who wears an unusual cylindrical crown resembling a vase. He has a calm, almost neutral expression, and reclines on an elaborate plinth surrounded by flowing fountains. It looks as though he's relaxing, watching over the tranquil body of water before him. It's like a beautiful, sea-green mirror. On warm summer evenings, Hadrian often hosts extravagant banquets by the pool. He knows the effect this place has on visitors. Everyone comments on its aesthetic perfection, complimenting him on the beautiful symmetry of its design. There's something dreamlike about it. But for Hadrian, the beauty of the pool also comes from its symbolism and the memories it brings back. It's designed to recreate the style and atmosphere of places he's visited on his long travels through northern Africa and Greece. When he went to Athens, Hadrian was struck by the splendor of the architecture and the rich culture. He has fond memories of his time there, exploring the city and participating in local festivals and rituals. Hadrian also treasures these memories for the time he spent with his beloved companion, Antinous. They met during Hadrian's travels in the east, in the kingdom of Bithynia. Ever since, the two men have been almost inseparable, traveling across the Roman Empire together. Whenever Hadrian is near the pool in his villa, he's transported back 
to those golden days in distant lands with Antinous by his side. Standing here by the water, he loses track of time as the happy memories come flooding back. When he reaches the far end of the pool, near the grotto, Hadrian stands still, gazing into the water. He's mesmerized by the glimmering reflections of the sunlight and the statues. The memories of the past gradually fade away, and his nostalgia shifts into another feeling, quiet contentment for this moment. Those days overseas were some of the best of his life, but this is also a happy, peaceful period. He's more relaxed now and more at ease with himself. Looking up, Hadrian takes in the whole scene. He admires the long expanse of the pool, surrounded by rows of columns and statues and elegant arches. Through careful design, he's turned a dream into a reality that's somehow even more magical. Soon, the evenings will be warm enough to host banquets here once again. There will be tables all around the pool, and countless guests sitting near the water, dining under the silver light of the moon. When Hadrian closes his eyes, he can almost hear the music and laughter mingling with the soft, gurgling sounds of the fountains. He's looking forward to these long, relaxed summer evenings with Antinous and his closest friends. Opening his eyes, Hadrian sees his dog, Lydia, sitting patiently beside him. It's time to walk on, Hadrian decides. He knows Lydia is happiest when they're on the move. She's too old to hunt now, but she still enjoys roaming across the estate, exploring all the different parts of the garden. As Hadrian walks along the path, away from the pool, Lydia trots ahead. She keeps her nose close to the ground, sniffing everything she sees. Hadrian watches with amusement, noticing how she's fascinated even by ordinary patches of grass. Every now and then, she'll stop to inspect a certain area, sniffing it repeatedly as though she can detect all kinds of intriguing scents. It's funny to think that Lydia is oblivious to her luxurious surroundings. She doesn't notice the sculptural masterpieces or the expensive stone beneath her paws. All that interests her is the presence of her master and the scents in the grass. She could be in any garden in the world, and she'd still be happy. This is one of the reasons why Hadrian is so fond of dogs. As well as offering loyal companionship and unconditional love, they also remind him to take pleasure in the more ordinary things in life. The buildings and artworks of the villa 
are beautiful, but so is this simple lawn. Hadrian breathes in deeply, savoring the rich scent of freshly cut grass. He may not be able to detect as many smells as Lydia, but this fragrance is good enough. And although it's a scent he associates with spring, it also fills him with anticipation for the summer to come. These moments of transition are some of the most beautiful times of the year. Spring turning to summer, then summer to autumn. As he reflects on this, breathing in the scents of the garden, Hadrian is filled with a sense of sweet nostalgia once again. But this time, it's not connected with any particular memory. It's just a general feeling of contentment spreading through him with a bittersweet tinge. Perhaps on some subconscious level, he feels this way because he's aware of the passing of time. It seems to be steadily speeding up as he gets older. He has the impression that it was only yesterday that he noticed this change from spring to summer. But it's already been a whole year. And next spring, he'll probably feel exactly the same way, surprised by the sudden passing of the seasons. Hadrian recalls a famous line from the poet Virgil. It escapes irretrievable time. These words have since become a popular phrase, tempus fugit, or time flies. When Hadrian first encountered this expression, studying literature as a young man, it didn't make a particular impression on him. In fact, he probably would have disagreed with the idea. In his adolescence, the days had seemed endless. It felt as though he had all the time in the world. But the poet was right. Ever since, time has flown for Hadrian. Becoming emperor at the age of 40 was a particular turning point, and the years seemed to be passing even more quickly. Perhaps it's a positive sign, thinks Hadrian. It means he's living a rich and fulfilling life full of interesting experiences. The realization of time passing quickly can also be a helpful reminder to slow down and enjoy moments such as these. As he continues along the garden path, Hadrian finds himself walking more slowly he pays attention to every step and every sensation, from the scent of the grass to the gentle warmth of the sun on the back of his neck. At one point, Lydia turns to look at him quizzically, wagging her tail. She must be getting impatient, wondering why her master is moving so slowly. Hadrian gives her an affectionate pat on the head, and then picks up pace slightly as they walk in the direction of the residential buildings. 
the emperor and his dog pass a grand complex of thermal baths, then cross numerous smaller gardens and courtyards. Finally, they reach a colonnaded porch, which is the entrance to their destination, Hadrian's private island. The island is the location of a large house. It's a private villa with more than 30 rooms, including bedrooms, a library, a study, and a small bath complex. This luxurious building occupies the entirety of an artificial island which is surrounded by a shallow moat. To access the villa, Hadrian crosses the moat on a retractable wooden drawbridge. Although the bridge is usually left in place, Hadrian likes the idea that he can raise the bridge once he's on the island. In this way, he has the place entirely to himself. He can study, relax, or sleep undisturbed. The idea of the private island was one of Hadrian's childhood fantasies. When he squabbled with his sister or wanted to avoid his schoolwork, he wished that he had somewhere to escape to. As a boy, Hadrian would often daydream about having his own special place. Not just a room, but an island. He would only allow select visitors, and sometimes nobody at all. It would be his own little realm, a place where he could do whatever he liked and enjoy some peace and privacy. In his childhood dreams, the island was a craggy rock surrounded by the blue ocean. The reality is a little different, but as he looks up, at the splendid house, its white marble gleaming in the sunlight, Hadrian feels deeply content. As a child, he could never have imagined that he would one day have an island that he'd designed himself. Hadrian steps onto the wooden drawbridge, with Lydia following at his heels. As he crosses the bridge, he glances down into the moat and catches sight of a shimmering fish darting just below the surface of the water. The moat is just one of many fish ponds scattered throughout the grounds of the estate. Hadrian finds the presence of the fish soothing, and he often stops to watch them as they swim slowly through the reeds. Perhaps his next project will be some kind of indoor pool or aquarium, filled with the most vibrant colourful fish. There might even be space in one of his bedrooms. Someday soon, he'll consult his architects and decide what to do next. Hadrian is a perpetual daydreamer and planner, and he always has at least a few ideas in the back of his mind. After crossing the bridge, Hadrian steps into the villa's grand entrance hall. 
The walls are decorated with an elaborate marble frieze depicting ships and sea creatures, while the floors are covered with complex mosaic patterns. The footsteps of Hadrian and Lydia echoing on the mosaic floor are the only sounds that can be heard. At the moment, there's no one else here. Many of the other buildings on the estate are busy with servants or visitors, but no one comes to the island house unless they have permission from the emperor. The nature of his work means Hadrian spends most of his time surrounded by other people. It's a pleasant change to come here, to his peaceful, silent house, where there's no need to talk. Right now, the quiet companionship of his dog is all he needs. Lydia pads softly ahead of him, heading towards the study. It's as though she can read his mind. She often seems to know where he's going before Hadrian himself has even decided. Hadrian follows the dog into the study. It's a large, airy room overlooking the moat. This is where Hadrian comes to focus on his personal interests, which have nothing to do with his role as an emperor. It's the place where he reads, writes poetry, studies philosophy, and makes architectural plans. Or sometimes, he just sits and stares out of the window, reminiscing or daydreaming. Hadrian enters the room with the intention to study for a while, or to make some sketches of the new fish pond. But instead, he finds himself reclining on the couch by the window, his mind wandering. Inevitably, his thoughts return once again to his past travels. He recalls the tour of southern Greece with Antinous, overseeing the restoration of ancient temples and shrines. When he closes his eyes, he can still see everything so clearly. He hopes he can return to these places one day, or perhaps travel somewhere new, journeying to distant lands on the far side of the empire. Throughout his life, Hadrian has always experienced these spells of intense wanderlust. But now that he's older, he also knows how to bring himself back to the present. Although he's looking forward to future travels, he's become more patient. For now, is perfectly happy right here. Opening his eyes, he sees that Lydia has settled down in the corner of the room. She's curled up in her favorite spot on a soft, worn piece of carpet. This old rug is perhaps the only thing in the villa that's in less than perfect condition. But Hadrian has resisted the urge to replace it. Lydia always heads straight towards the rug, 
making herself comfortable at the center, and then sleeping the afternoon away. As he watches Lydia dozing peacefully, Hadrian also starts to feel sleepy. He's tired from his busy week and feeling pleasantly relaxed after his stroll through the gardens. There's nothing he has to do today, so there's no reason why he shouldn't have a nap as well. Perhaps this is another sign that he's starting to get old, he thinks, smiling to himself. An afternoon nap is another of life's simple luxuries. After rearranging the cushions on the couch, Hadrian lies back and closes his eyes. He takes a deep breath in and instantly feels his body and mind becoming still. The room is cool and silent. The only thing he can hear is the dog's quiet snoring and his own steady breathing. His breaths are slow and deep, settling into a comfortable, natural rhythm as they guide him towards sleep. At last, Hadrian's thoughts of his villa and his travels fade away into the background. The emperor is about to enter another peaceful, private world. The realm of sleep.